uh, Dr. Gerber asked if he should introduce me, and I said, no, but if you do, just call me the oldest heretic in the room. <laughs> um, and for those of you who didn't hear the presentations yesterday, um, uh, I've been at this for a long time and uh, found myself orthogonal to the mainstream for most of that time. Um, and just in my background, how I got into this was uh, in medical school, um, I dealt with the stress of medical school by riding, trying to ride bicycles over mountains. And this was back in the uh, 1960s, and I didn't know about carbohydrate loading and the importance of carbohydrate for endurance and, and vigorous physical performance. And I probably bonked or hit the wall 30 times trying to go over the same mountain. You know, you think eventually you get the, and I finally realized if I ate enough carbs, I could go over the mountain and ride back and it would, you know, go 100 miles. And, and, you know, it was amazing what you could do if you ate enough carbs. And I became a, you know, died in the wool carb advocate. Uh, of my own experience. And when I got to my internship and residency, not long into that experience in 1975, I got into a discussion with an auspicious, auspicious attending physician named Ethan Allen Hitchcock Sims. And if any of you <laughs> know anything about uh, the, the history of this country, Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys from Vermont stole a bunch of cannons from the British and changed the course of the battle around Boston. And Ethan was of that lineage. And Ethan, and this is 75, 72 was when Bob Atkins published his first book. And there were a lot of people doing the Atkins diet. And I said, you know, this is complete crap. You know, you're going to be completely debilitated if you don't eat carbs. And Ethan said, well, I know some people are on this diet, and they don't seem debilitated. I said, well, you know, this can't be true. He said, well, let's do a research project. You know, if I, if I hadn't done this, or if I had done a better job at that research, I wouldn't have been a heretic. <laughs> So let me share with you a little bit of my perspective on low-carb diets and some about physical performance. You've heard some of that from uh, Peter Defty and Peter, Dr. Peter Bruckner yesterday. Um, and I'll try not to bore you too much with that. But let's sort of go through this odyssey. So working with my good friend, collaborator, and co-author Jeff Volick over the last 12 years, we've tried to bring together a lot of the pieces of what's gone before. And we have attempted to define nutritional ketosis as something which is unique metabolically from the fed state where, carbohydrate fed state, where ketone values are very low. And we define that as under 0.5 millimolar on the left side there. So when you get above 0.5 millimolar, beta hydroxybutyrate in the plasma becomes a significant substrate to feed the brain. And as you go from 0.5 up to 3 millimolar, that is a range in which beta hydroxybutyrate increasingly becomes an important contributor to fuel flow in the body. So what we show you on the vertical axis there is improvement in fuel flow stemming from fat, you know, uh, stored body fat or from dietary fat. It's only when you get above 3 to 5, some people post-exercise, because exercise in many people stimulates ketone production. Uh, and you might get as high as five post-exercise. Five to seven is really an area of starvation ketosis. And ketoacidosis doesn't begin until you get above 10 millimolar. But endocrinologists will tell you that if a patient comes into the emergency room, a type 1 diabetic comes into the ER with a blood sugar over 150 and a beta hydroxybutyrate level of point, or 3 millimolar, that they're in ketoacidosis. That's predictive of them developing ketoacidosis, but they're not acidemic until they get above 10. So anything up to 10 will do you no harm as long as you have significant beta cell reserve. That is, your pancreas beta cells can make enough insulin to moderate ketone production. And you know, we think of glucose being controlled by, by insulin, but ketone levels are also controlled by insulin with a similar feedback inhibitory loop. So ketones are a valuable fuel controlled and, you know, through an endocrine feedback loop involving insulin. Uh, and you need insulin to control ketone levels in the same way you need insulin to control glucose levels. So it's a bimodal role for insulin. Um, so how does one you know, make these ketones? Where do they come from? And I, again, I, I apologize for the size of the slide. And it's old because this, the, the slide on the right um, is basically a, deep, a, a cartoon by George Cahill 
from some absolutely elegant research that his group did in the 1960s where they defined starvation metabolism in humans. Um, and it's important because starvation metabolism in dogs is different. Starvation metabolism in rats is different. Humans are, are quite unique because we have a very large brain that we have to feed. And we feed that brain when we're not eating any carbs with a combination of ketones and glucose. Now, the higher your ketones go, up to 3, 4, 5 millimolar, the greater the proportion that can be fed from ketones. And by the way, Cahill's and group did a, a study that they tried not to have to publish, because once they did that, they realized it was unethical to have done it. And what they did was they took people in starvation ketosis, infused insulin into, their, uh, into the, the vein in their arm to drive down glucose. They drove glucose down to under 30 milligrams per deciliter, under, down to 1.5 millimolar, which in a, a non-ketonemic person would cause coma and death. And what they proved is that at 1.5 millimolar glucose, these patients remained lucid and asymptomatic. So they proved that ketones are as good or better a fuel for the brain than glucose. But they did it in 1972 or 73. The, the uh, Treaty of, of uh, Helsinki in 1975 defined human subject research and the need for IRB approved research and that you don't do any research that would endanger your subjects. And they said, crap, we can't publish this. <laughs> And so it was hidden in the book chapter. If anybody wants the chapter, I've got a PDF, and I'd be happy to give it to you. So what they defined in terms of, of, of ketone metabolism that is within five to seven days of starvation, ketone levels come up and stabilize, that most of the brain's energy comes from ketones, but still a minor component comes from glucose. And when the body runs out of glycogen stored in liver or muscles after a few days, then that glucose has to come from gluconeogenesis. And that gluconeogenic uh, uh, glucose basically comes, most of, almost all of it comes from muscle protein. And so if you look at the little muscle-shaped thing on the lower right-hand side over here, even in prolonged starvation, there is an egress of, net egress of amino acids out of here going to the liver for gluconeogenesis. And that then is a minor component of the brain fuel. Most of it comes from beta-hydroxybutyrate. And so your liver is feeding most of your brain but in starvation, your muscles are broken down. And even after a month of total starvation, no protein coming in, you're losing four ounces of lean body mass per day. So think of even in the, the most adapted human, starvation ketosis is robbing you of a quarter pounder every day. And that's coming from lean body mass. It's coming from functional tissue. Now, we're different than, than the sleeping black bear Ralph Nelson in Minnesota did some amazing research. He climbed into the dens of bears during their winter sleep and drew blood samples from <laughs> sleeping black bears. It takes them a while to warm up. You know? so if, if you're quick on the phlebotomy, you can be out of there before the claws. And then migrating gray whales that feed in the Arctic and, calve in, and, and mate and calve in the, what used to be called the Sandwich Islands, we now call it Hawaii. Um, they, you know, they travel 5,000 miles, and they don't eat for 5,000 miles of, of travel. And they don't lose lean body mass. And the sleeping black bear does not lose lean body mass. We humans have a much bigger brain relative to the size of our body, and we can't do that. So there is a requirement for protein on a daily basis. If, and well, I'll say if you go more than 24 hours without any food intake, you will have loss of lean body mass. It accelerates to its maximum in about the third day of starvation. And then your body slowly adapts, and then it tapers down. But you never get down below a quarter pounder a day. And what I'm saying is that in, uh, different than what uh, Dr. Fung told you yesterday. And we're di we differ in terms of where we draw our data. But you know, maybe my data is old and antiquated, but it's, it has never been refuted. So how do, how do you manage? to get in nutritional ketosis, but give people enough nutrients that you preserve lean body mass and function. So Jeff Volick made this slide. He's, any slides I have that are good were made by Jeff. He's really phenomenal in terms of visuals. And he said, well, let's lay out the difference between some of the, the what people call the standard diets, typical diets. So in the upper left-hand corner in the, the yellow-orange there is the Ornish diet. And the Ornish diet is a plant-based, almost vegetarian diet. Um, that is very high in carbohydrate, very low in fat, and very, very relatively low in protein. And this works in some people as a very effective tool. 
but I can show you data that it doesn't work in a lot of people. Uh, and so there's no one perfect diet. This is good for some people, but it's at the, quote, extreme of reduced fat intake. Um, under that comes what we call the standard American diet. I love the acronym for that. It's sad. Um, as you come down in carbohydrate on the vertical axis, you come to the Mediterranean diet. You can see it's a pretty big bulb there because, as people said yesterday, you know, the Mediterranean diet is in the eye of the, the beholder in terms of what it really entails. But typically, a Mediterranean diet is 30 to 40 percent of energy is carbs. It's moderate in protein. And it could, provides in the order of 40% of calories as fat. And most people agree that in the Mediterranean, most of those calories as fat came from monounsaturated fat, typically olive oil. Um, then, again, the diet that has a somewhat broader definition, but using Lauren Cordain's definition of, of the paleo diet, it's typically around 30% of energy is protein. And it has a floor of 20% of the energy. And this is not intake. This is energy expenditure, by the way. Um, and there's a difference, and I, we can talk about that in, in the question and answer people, period if people want to, want to understand why I say that. But typically, it's between 20 and 30 percent of energy is carbohydrates, 30 percent is protein. And although that is in the class of low carbohydrate diets, it is not a ketogenic diet. In other words, people who eat 30 percent of their daily energy requirement is protein and, and a minimum of 20 percent as carbs will not have a ketone value at or above 0.5 millimolar until, unless or until they cross the finish line of a marathon. So if you st start a marathon having eaten a, meta or a Mediterranean diet, by the time you get to 26 mile, you will have burned through enough of your carbs that you will actually be building ketone levels. And that's called the Cortis Douglas effect. And they were two South African scientists who, who defined post-exercise ketosis. Um, and so you can get to 0.5. At the, shortly after you finish the marathon, as the body is trying to figure out what, how to feed the brain when you've just depleted the body of almost all, if not all, of its glycogen. To get into nutritional ketosis, you have to keep protein moderate. So this is not a high protein diet. It's typically in the range of um, 10 to 20 percent of energy is protein. The, the top, the, the highest carbohydrate you can take in that range of protein intake is 10 percent and still get above 0.5 millimolar for most people. Uh, there may be some exceptions. But the more protein, because protein stimulates insulin release to some degree, similar to carbohydrate. The more protein you eat, the less carb you have to eat. And that's why that blue triangle there tapers off as you go up in protein. So this has to be moderate in protein and low in carbohydrate. Uh, we differ one from another in what our carbohydrate tolerance is. And the more insulin resistant a person is, then the lower you have to come in carbs to stay in nutritional ketosis. That is that zone 0.5 to 3 millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate. So that's tough to do. You know, this is not a big target. This is a small target. We say this is like trying to fly an airplane from San Francisco to, to uh, Hawaii, to Honolulu. People say, well, where is it? And you say, well, let's go that way. Well, if you have a plane that has 2,500 miles worth of fuel and you go that way and you're off by three or four degrees on the compass, you'll never see the damn island. <laughs> and you're going to have a long swim back home. You really, it does take a certain amount of coaching and guidance to get this right. So if it's that tough, why do it? You know, I mean, you can feed your brain with glucose. All of us have done that for most, if not most, if of all of our lives. Well, again. If you like the slide, Jeff Volek made it. <laughs> so on the top, you see adipose tissue, that yellow blob on the left. You see the liver in the middle and the brain on the right across the top. And what I showed you from the work done by Cahill, adipose tissue stores thousands, tens of thousands of calories in your body. Your liver can utilize that under controlled, endocrinely, endocrinologically, endocrinologically controlled mechanism to make enough ketones to feed your brain whether you're in nutritional ketosis and eating some carbs and protein, or whether you're in total starvation, your brain's going to stay alive. The lights are going to stay on. It's really elegant. Okay? And that's what we thought this was good for up until about three or four years ago. And in December of 2012, a group of people I never heard of uh, at the Gladstone Institute of the University of San Francisco, University of California, San Francisco, published a paper in Science and said, 
Guess what? Beta-hydroxybutyrate uh, downregulates a group of enzymes called histone deacetylase inhibit. It downregulates histone deacetylases. So beta-hydroxybutyrate is a selective signal to turn down the activity of a certain enzymes. And these enzymes are gene silencing enzymes. Now this gets complex. You're turning down enzymes which silence the genes that protect you from oxidative stress. So it's complex. But what it means is when you eat carbohydrates, a whole system of defense against oxidative stress that has evolved, if you believe in evolution, over a billion years, those enzymes get turned off, which means you need to eat antioxidants when you eat carbohydrates, because your God-given antioxidant system is shut off by eating bread, drinking grape juice, whatever. Um, and I don't want to get into religion, but uh, you know, carbs are part of our religion, our, of, our, of our agricultural heritage. Uh, and they turn off a system that protects us from oxidative stress and inflammation. Well, what, what importance is that clinically? Well, a number of subsequent papers show that upper airway inflammation and asthma are uh, 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 caused by downregulating these enzymes. That if you take a little nematode called C. elegans and you grow that nematode in regular culture medium, it lives typically for 20 days. If you grow it in a culture medium that contains beta, enough beta-hydroxybutyrate, it lives 26% longer. Now, the nema, this nematode is a darling of the longevity research community because it only lives 20 days. You know, if you do a study on humans, you've got to run it for at least 80 or 90 years. Do a study on monkeys, 35 years. Do a study on mice, it's three and a half years. You, know, you can do a full study in 20 days. So they use this for screening compounds that improve human they think or, or we're, we're looking for compounds to improve human longevity. And if you've got a drug that you could show was safe to use and extended human life, or extended the life of these, these worms by 26%, you'd have a billion dollar, $10 billion, $100 billion drug candidate. And we've got it. We make it in our liver. It's called beta-hydroxybutyrate. And by the way, it, doesn't, it does decrease oxidative stress and inflammation. But OK, so there's a reason to want to do this. Who knows how to do this? I mean, where is it in the textbooks? Uh, there's not much written in standard textbooks. So let's call upon a panel of experts to figure out how to do this. Here are my first two experts. <laughs> These are two Inuit women. Photograph was taken around 1910. They knew more about how to prepare a ketogenic diet, what mix of meat and fat, how you fed it to your family, how you fed it to your grandchildren to make them grow, be strong, and functional. They knew more about this than I will ever know. Unfortunately, they were not illiterate people, very smart. I mean, they, they invented some amazing technology, the igloo. Anybody here ever slept in an igloo? Yeah. I mean, compared to a tent in the winter, igloo is the Hilton. It's warm, one candle lights the whole thing, no wind, quiet, but anyway, I won't get it. <laughs> really smart people didn't write it down. So we don't know what they ate. There were some Anglos who went among the Inuit, and rather than bringing our culture to them, some of them wrote down stuff about their culture. And this guy, Frederick Swatko, which was a US Army uh, 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 surgeon, decided that he wanted to go into the Arctic, learn from the Inuit how they lived in the Arctic, and then travel to the, up to the islands in the Canadian Arctic to try to figure out what happened to a British uh, expedition seeking the Northwest Passage, which is called the Franklin Expedition. 129 men, two ships, went into the Arctic in 1843 and disappeared. And it became the quest of the late 1800s to determine the fate of the Franklin Expedition. And these guys wanted to actually just find, find where the, if they'd gone ashore and buried their log books in a, in a cairn to find out what happened to them. And so they recruited two Inuit families. They traveled 3,000 miles in 14 months, living almost the whole time. They started out with a little bit of provisions for the first week or two. And unfortunately, Stephon, you know, even now, we don't teach physicians about nutrition, but you know, US Army surgeons in the 1800s weren't really big into grams of protein and, you know, amounts of carbohydrate and so on. So what he wrote down instead in his diary was something that for me was quite prophetic. 
a, he was a prophet in the, of, of something which I have termed, a term I came up with called keto adaptation. And he pointed out that when you first go on the diet of the native, one is ill disposed to travel because of fatigue. But this goes away within two to three weeks. Now, this was the topic of my dissertation research. I discovered this quote while I was writing my P thesis, and I thought I'd discovered this. This guy beat me by 100 years. <laughs> but it's an important observation. We don't transit from being carb fed to fat fed easily. It takes time. And it takes, you know, so you have to adapt. So, but he didn't write down how much fat, you know, when you kill the seal, when you kill the caribou, what did you feed to the dogs? What did you say for yourself, your children, and your loved ones? And you feed the dogs the meat, and the humans eat the fat. Exactly. <laughs> but, so how do we know that? Another Arctic explorer, and somebody who's even more of a heretic than I, before my time, was this guy named Wilhelm Stefansson. He was Icelandic origin, born in Canada, trained in University of North Dakota and then Harvard. And he was very much interested in the ethnology of the Inuit, um, with which his Icelandic peoples had, had uh, uh, interacted over, uh, in the Greenland area over, over time in, in history. And so he lived in the Arctic, learned their language, learned their ways of, of hunting, and learned how to build igloos. And he traveled through areas of the Arctic that Europeans had never been to. There's an island name for Stefansson in the Arctic, in the Canadian Arctic. Um, and he came back to, to civilization and said, you know, I could go for two years living on just meat and fat. I never ate any vegetables, and I didn't get sick. And this was the time, unfortunately, when all the 12 vitamins were defined, between 1914 and 1928. And he's there saying, you don't need to eat vegetables. You don't need vitamin C. And he was called a liar by his academic colleagues and in the press. And to salvage his reputation, he allowed himself to be locked up in Bellevue Hospital in New York City, then as now, a place for lunatics. And he was allowed to eat anything he wanted as long as it consisted of meat and fat. And his, the skeptics, the scientists who, who ran this project, wrote down precisely what he ate. And what does Stefansson eat? He ate about 115 grams of protein per day, which was between 15 and 20% of his daily energy expenditure. He ate over 200 grams of fat per day, and his carbohydrate intake was less, limited to less than 2% of energy, and that was carbohydrate provided by the glycogen in the meat when the animals were slaughtered. He ate no vegetables, no visible carbs. He did this for a year. They were sure he was going to have scurvy within four months. Now, again, talk about ethics and research. Because this is a research project where they tried to make these guys sick. There were two of them, Stefansson and one other Arctic explorer. And they remained hale and hearty for the whole year. And by the way, they ate this moderate protein, very high fat diet, and had no change in weight. And after a few weeks, had no loss of performance. And they did allow them out to exercise, but they had to go out with an attendant. And they had to pick well-trained attendants to keep up with them when they were running around, running circles around <laughs> um, Central Park in New York City. He was clearly not impaired. So this then would be my estimation of indirectly of what those Inuit women knew. Because I figured if Stefansson wanted to save his reputation, he was going to do his best to recreate with market foods available in New York City the macronutrient composition that he ate in the Arctic. So with that as kind of the hypothesis, so he ate it, he survived for a year. By the way, he lived to be 85. He died, he had clean coronary arteries, but he died of a stroke, and he did have significant uh, calcified lesions in the circle of Willis and the circulation of the brain. I know that because I talked to the doctor who did his autopsy, who was one of my teachers in Vermont named Elliot Danforth. And he did the autopsy when he was a resident in general medicine, whatever, at, at the Mary Hitchcock in, in uh, Dartmouth, uh, 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 Hanover, New Hampshire. Anyway, I happened to stumble into some of these people. So I didn't meet Stefan, but I think I know a bit about him. So the next question is, OK, if you can do it, that's fine, but is it safe? I mean, you're eating a lot of fat. You're not eating much carbs. You're not getting all those healthy phytonutrients from dark leafy greens and purple vegetables. And I admit, those have value in the diet, particularly if you're eating carbs. You got to eat them because you put your natural antioxidant system to sleep with the carbs. Okay. So Jeff Volick, keep mentioning his name because if it weren't for him, 
we wouldn't be here talking about this. Well, you'd be here talking about something else, but we've been talking about this. So Jeff did a research project where he, he and his graduate student, Cassandra Forsyth, recruited 40 people with metabolic syndrome, atherogenic dyslipidemia. Half of them were put on a, a low fat, high carb weight loss diet, and half of them were put on a low carb, high fat diet. And they were on it for 12 weeks. They got blood samples before and after. And if you look at these pie charts here, recognize that this is a 1,500 calorie per day diet, the low fat diet. So they restricted them to 1,500 calories a day. The low carb diet, this is how much they ate to satiety. So they matched the intake of this group to the low carb group. But I'll also point out that this group of overweight, not particularly physically active people, were probably burning 2,500 calories a day. So 1,500 is coming in the mouth. Realize that when you look at the pie chart in terms of what the body's burning, what you're not seeing is 1,000 calories that's coming from body fat. So this fat here intake of 59% actually is closer to the Stefanson value, 75 or 80% of energy was coming from fat because the unseed stuff is coming from adipose tissue. And further, this 24% fat here would be bigger and the proportion of carbs would be lower. But this is, by any definition, a relatively high carbohydrate, energy-restricted diet, and this is a high-fat, moderate-protein, low-carb diet. And so they're on it for a total of 12 weeks. And if you look at the very bottom of the slide, you'll see that on the people on the low-carb diet ate 36 grams of saturated fat per day. People on the high-carb diet ate 12 grams. So just by chance, three times as much saturated fat intake in the people eating the low-carb diet. So big difference in saturated fat intake in particular. This is the weight loss curve for, the, for both groups. So both groups lost weight, and both groups were still losing weight at the end of 12 weeks. But you see the weight loss is different. And you saw this data summarized in, in a, a bigger slide yesterday um, in terms of the efficacy of, of, of a low carb and, and, and weight loss. And people say, well, most of the difference is water. No, only about one, one and a half kilograms difference was water, and the rest was greater fat loss in the people on the uh, high fat, low carb diet. Um, and the reference is bottom there is, is by Cassandra Forsyth, the first author, and that was in the journal Lipids in 2008. So I want to summarize very quickly a little bit of the data from the study. This is a gold mine of data. But if you look at the LDL cholesterol, the top line, um, it went up 3% and down 2%. But this change in LDL was not statistically significant. But if you look at the next line down, the LDL cholesterol particle size, this is, one, this is the first study that measured particles, LDL particle size uh, in, with a, a, effect, a, a proper technique in people on a low-carb diet. And this 3% increase in LDL particle size is actually very significant. The bigger your LDL is, the less atherogenic it is. So although the LDL amount didn't go down, the atherogenicity of the LDL was significantly reduced. HDL went up 13%. In the high-carb group, which is typical for what we see, only 1% in the other group in spite of their weight loss. And you'll see that triglycerides went down in both groups dramatically in the low-carb group. That, and what's fascinating, if you look at saturated fat, uh, the third from, line from the bottom, it went down, proportion went down in both groups, but it went down more in the group, which was eating three times as much saturated fat per day. So if you believe that you are what you eat, I'm sorry, in this case, you are not what you eat. Because when you adapt to, to a ketogenic diet, and I'll show you that data in the next couple slides, when you adapt to a ketogenic diet, you dramatically enhance your body's use of fat. And guess which fat it likes to use? Saturated fat. It becomes your high octane fuel. If you eat it and turn it into CO2 and water, it can't, as Dr. Oz likes to say, glom up your coronary arteries, which isn't how Atherogenesis works, but anyway. Saturated fat can't, can't kill you if it goes away. And when you calculate the saturated fat concentration in the, in the triglycerides, including the reduction in triglycerides, the change is dramatic. And probably the most important slide, or the line on the slide is the bottom, bottom one. We know that weight loss causes reduced, reduction in inflammation in, with most diets. But there was significantly greater reduction in inflammation in the people on the low-carb diet. And this 14 out of 14, you know, we don't trust one biomarker. We don't just do IL-6 or TNF-alpha or PI-1 or total white sound. We do them all. And all 14 went down. 
And six of the 14 went down great, to a, great, a significantly greater degree with low carb diet. And this is a robust observation that when you actually get people in nutritional ketosis, the reduction in saturated fat and the reduction in inflammation is not subtle. It's, it's, as some of the political candidates like to say, huge. So again, I, would, I was of the opinion going into this that you needed a lot of carbs for physical performance. Uh, I did a study with Ethan Sims and Ned Horton in Vermont, who are phenomenal mentors. Uh, but we did it on untrained people. And we showed that it, at one week, your performance went down. Six weeks, it came way back up. But they lost a lot of weight. And maybe the weight loss enhanced performance. <clears throat> so we decided to do a study in people who, A, were highly trained, and B, weren't going to lose any weight. So we took some guys who were really skinny, highly trained bike racers, and we put them on basically the Stefanson diet. And we could only lock them up in the metabolic ward for one month because that's all the time they'd give us to do anything this, this bizarre. My thesis committee thought that I couldn't get people to eat 85% of their calories as fat. So it's impossible to get a human to eat 85% of his, his, his energy as fat. But as you all know, bike racers have cast iron stomachs. They eat ham with sandwiches riding over, over Loveland Pass. <laughs> so we, we got to eat this, the Stefanson diet for a month. And you know, technically on the slide, the top line of VO2, VO2 max shows you that their peak aerobic power was not changed. And by the way, a five liter per minute VO2 max is a huge. These guys have big engines. Okay? Their returns time to exhaustion after four weeks of adaptation was statistically the same. 151 versus 147 minutes, so no change in endurance time to exhaustion. But what changed dramatically, if you look at the RQ here, RQ is, the, is a measure of CO2 production compared to O2 consumption, and it tells you roughly the proportion of energy being used from carbohydrate and fat. If you're burning all carbohydrate, theoretically your RQ would be 1.0. If you're burning all fat, it would be 0.7. At baseline on the, on the control diet, these guys had an RQ of 0.83, right in the middle. So they were bringing about 50-50 carbon fat for two and a half hours of exercise. After just four weeks of adaptation, I say just, because as I'll imply in a couple slides, it might have been different if they went longer. Their RQ was 0.72. That was that far away from all fat. We got this published in Metabolism at 83. It took three years to get it past the reviewers, because they were sure it wasn't true. But that implies that 90% of their fuel was coming from fat. And they're exercising at 930 calories per hour. And again, I was criticized. It wasn't stress, stress, it wasn't enough exercise. It wasn't hard enough exercise. And I would say, you go out and exercise at 930 calories an hour for two and a half hours. And tell me if you're in a basement room looking at a concrete wall, going nowhere. <laughs> Glycogen use. This shows you the use during. So we did muscle biopsies before and after. And that's still ethical to do, by the way. You use a needle about the size of this pen, go into the quadriceps and whack out 150 to 200 milligrams of muscle. And then. So they cut their glycogen use by a factor of over three, which violated all the rules from the carbohydrate loading. Brilliant studies done in Sweden by Bergstrom, Holtman, Saltine. Did I pronounce those names right? <laughs> Andreas is being nice to me. I mean, these did, guys did great research, but they never did a low-carb study beyond uh, 14 days because they didn't know about keto adaptation. And I asked Per Bjorntorp how, why they didn't do a longer study. He said, Steve, you can't get people to eat that much meat because he thought it was a high-protein diet, not a high-fat diet. So, this is the time to exhaustion. And I've been criticized because, see, one was sort of flat, two went up, and two went down. And people say, well, that one guy who went way up, he biased the whole thing. And yes, two of the guys didn't go as long as they did when they were on the high-carb diet. But three of them went as long or longer. And this is normal human variation. And I think part of the variation is some of us take longer than four weeks to fully adapt. Swatka could do it in two or three weeks. But some people, some of our athletes tell us two, three, four months. Right, Peter? Yeah. And this shows a glycogen chain pre and post. They ended up at the same level. 
did the same amount of work, but they did it on a lot less glycogen. So even at four weeks of adaptation, they became extremely parsimonious of carbohydrate as fuel. Now, I left that data there in that form, you know, RQ.73. Nobody really knew what that meant. And along comes this guy, Jeff Volek. <laughs> he said, Steve, these Dutch people, Yukon groups, group, um, and a, a delightful woman named uh, Dr. Venables studied 300 people. And I think, Peter, you showed this yeah. data yesterday. Uh, so she analyzed peak fat oxidation in 300 people from obese, untrained people to highly trained athletes. The highest rate of fat oxidation she could find in any person out of 300 was 60 grams an hour or one gram per minute. So Jeff took my five bike racers and did the lowest, the highest, and the mean. The mean was 90. So that's one and a half grams of fat oxidation per minute. And the highest guy was almost two grams a minute. And that's probably pretty close to, to John, the fighter pilot guy, um, of, at almost two grams. I mean, this, is pro, this is prodigious fat oxidation. And it's been sitting out there and really unappreciated until people like Peter Defty and Jeff Volek came along and sort of slapped me upside the head and said, you know, it's, it's heresy, but it's true. <laughs> He saw this picture of Tim Olson. He won the Western States, took 21 minutes off the all-time course record. In 2012, people said it was a fluke. Somebody suggested he probably had a horse hidden in the bushes and, <laughs> and did. He consumed half the gels of any of his competitors. He was consuming, he had 1,400 in-race calories, roughly. He said one gel an hour, 14 hours. 1,200. Yeah, the, the rule of thumb at the Western States, if you don't eat 6,000 calories of carbs, you don't get to the finish line. Because it's a 10 to 12,000 calorie event, and you can only put 2,000 of glycogen in your body. So you, you start at the starting line with this tiny little 2,000 cal fuel, fuel tank, and you're looking at a 12,000 calorie expenditure. How do you get there? Now, if you look at this guy, he's skinny. You know? He could take a shower in a shotgun barrel. <laughs> that's skinny. But if you ground him up, you would find, even crossing the finish line, you'd find 25 or 30,000 calories of body fat. So crossing the finish line, he's got fuel to do two more events, if you can get him to run on fat. Other people have done it, and you've seen some of these pictures yesterday. The, you know, the amazing people are these ultra runners who run 100 miles or 172 miles, whatever. Um, but my favorites are my friends, Sami Inken and Meredith Lorian, the ones on the right. They're in their little high-tech rowboat here. They're rowing across the Pacific Ocean. The fastest time any two men have rowed from California to Hawaii was 60 days. They did it on 70% fat, 10% carbs, 20% protein. 69 days? No. 45 days and three hours. Keto adapted. Because they didn't hit the wall. They didn't have to stop rowing every two hours and eat carbs. So you've seen some of the data from Jeff's FASTER study, which is really going to change. It's a, this is an earthquake in, uh, in, uh, in uh, sports nutrition. So we had a group of, of runners, half of whom chose to eat a high-carb diet, half chose to eat a low-carb diet. And on the low-carb diet, uh, and they're perfectly matched in terms of age, performance, et cetera, et cetera. And when you had them run on a treadmill for three hours, you can see the even at three hours, the high carb runners could only get down to 60% of energy from fat. The low carb runners did exactly what my bike racers did, but Jeff has defined this in a much better way than I ever did. Uh, and the results are convincing people that things are, it's different. But it's not just not running on mostly fat, it's the reduction in inflammation, and it's the improvement in well-being and recovery afterwards. And of course, this shift not only does the, is the fat oxidation higher, but you shift it to the right. You shift high fat oxidation rates into race pace for endurance athletes. And again, this will have to be in the next edition of every exercise physiology textbook. Yeah. It will. It has to be. You can't deny it. Because this is the second study that showed it. <laughs> <laughs> and it only came 40 years later than, well, I won't get there. One of the most amazing quotes is from this guy who was one of the high carb athletes in Jeff's study. And when he heard about the results of the study, he said, I'm going to try that low-carb thing. And I, I don't know if you can read it. it says, but I, may, I made the switch to high fat near the end of July. It changed my life. Just like you said, it took a few weeks. Now I'm reaping the benefits. Not only is my body composition improved, so is my performance. I won a 100-mile, I'm sorry, 100-kilometer trail run a few weeks ago and broke the course record by over an hour. You can imagine we got this guy's attention. 
And what he says is, besides the performance benefits, overall I feel so much better. Yeah, this is not a drug. This isn't something where you come down off the drug, you, t you feel better the next day. Was it John the fighter pilot who eight weeks or eight days after running the Western States went back to his job in Washington, D.C. and run the, ran the fastest eight miles of his life? Yeah. Was he? And he started out almost a vegetarian. <laughs> Look, if you didn't hear, he started out almost a vegetarian. So think of a truck going down the highway and it's running on the, the fuel from this little tank. It's got this big tank full of fuel. The little tank is glycogen, the big one is, is body fat. Which one do you want to be running on? And you can do it if you make the switch. So there are these benefits of reduced oxidative stress, inflammation, excellent fuel flow. Is this a boring diet? You don't have to eat the Stefanson diet. You can have four, four or five servings of, of non-starchy vegetables. You can have olives, you can have tomato, you can have mushrooms, green beans, cheese, because I don't believe in the ideology that you can't eat something that didn't exist 15,000 years ago. Because if we couldn't do that, we, couldn't come, we would have had to come up here on snowshoes. You couldn't have come up here on a, on a highway in cars. I think cheese is a modern technology that I happen to like. Heavy cream is a modern technology I like. <laughs> there are many ways of doing this wrong. And I'll stop right here and just say, we, you, know, we, you can read about this. I'd be happy to, if people want copies of the books that Jeff and I wrote, I would be happy to give anybody in this audience a copy, just give me your address. But you can't just eat low carb. You have to have the right kinds of fats. It includes eating saturated fats, not being afraid of saturated fats, because they're your high octane fuel. You've got to eat enough salt, because if you don't, if you restrict carbs and restrict salt, you become hyperaldosteronemic. That makes your cortisol go up. And this whole myth of adrenal fatigue because of low carb diets is for want of a pinch of salt. It's not a high salt diet, it's a moderate salt diet. And I think Peter showed you the slide yesterday, but there's an elegant study done in Canada, 17 countries, 100,000 people. The optimum salt intake, not for low carbers, people eating a balanced, quote, balanced diet, for longevity is at five grams a day, not 2.3. So one can do it. It doesn't have to be high salt, just a modicum of salt. And I'll end there, thank you, and picture of me on my favorite mountain.